Hey everybody, what's happening in the world? It's February 3rd, and are you having a good time? Or are you losing it? Because Biden just called Trump a sick fuck. Those words coming from the same guy who said we were made in the image of God. Also, we just bombed Syria and Iraq. Again. North Korea is readying its war preparedness. And China, as we learned from the FBI director's testimonial this week, that they intend on hacking our infrastructure, including water, electricity, and sewage, around 2027. So things are looking pretty bright. Let's get into it. The smoking gun proof from the fossil fuel industry knew of climate danger as early as 1954, documents show. An industry-backed air pollution foundation uncovered the severe harm climate change would wreak. You've all seen the Keeling curve? Well, apparently, new unearthed documents have shown that Charles Keeling, the so-called inventor of this, was funded by $13,000 worth of fossil fuel money to research what effect this might have. And this report uncovered by Rebecca John at Climate Investigation Center, published by the climate website Dismog, the possible consequences of changing concentrations of the CO2 in the atmosphere in reference to climate rates of photosynthesis and rates of equilibrium with carbonate and oceans may ultimately prove considerable significance to civilization. Epstein, a researcher at Caltech, wrote in the group 1954. So this shows that they had intimate involvement in the inception of modern climate science along with its warnings of the severe harm it would wreak. Not only publicly deny this science for decades and fund ongoing efforts to delay action on the crisis. So these are a startling confirmation that big oil has had its finger on the academic science for nearly 70 years, twice my lifetime as well. And they make a mockery of the oil industry denial of basic climate science decades later. He was a 26 year old Caltech researcher then and died in 2005. Although the Earth's CO2 levels now is at 422 parts per million, which is nearly a third higher than the first readings taken in 1958 and a 50% jump on pre-industrial levels. This essential tracking of the primary heat trapping gases has pushed global temperatures higher than previously experienced in human civilization. A total of 18 automotive companies, including Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors, gave money to the foundation, including banks, retailers, and contributed funding. So what do you need to know? It means that you just come back to the oil and gas industry again and again. They were omnipresent in this space. The industry was not just on notice, but deeply aware of the potential climate implications of its products for, again, 70 years. A bit more alarming is the bird flu in Antarctica spreading to penguins and potentially other species in the area, uh, two researchers here, among many who are conducting investigations on that, as we here in the western U.S. see unprecedented weather in 500 years. I'm aware Southern California is about to get hit by another atmospheric river, although a hot drought refers to the concurrent drought conditions that are stretching across the country, largely because of CC, published in the Journal of Science. And these findings uh, from 1553 to 2020, analyzing tree rings show temperature changes through soil moisture. They discovered that in the past 20 years, the Western US has been the hottest in over five century. It's not only begun, but it's going to continue. And we might expect the frequency of compound hot and dry events, hot drought, to increase over the course of this century. A bit more alarming is rising sea levels could lead to more methane emitted from wetlands. As sea levels rise due to global warming, ecosystems are being altered. One small silver lining scientists had believed is that the tidal wetlands found in estuaries might produce less methane as the increase of influx of Seawater makes these habitats less hospitable and methane-producing microbes. However, research from biologists at Lawrence Berkeley, Berkeley Lab indicate that these assumptions aren't always true, and examining 11 wetland zones, a team found that wetland region exposed to even a slight amount of seawater was emitting surprising high levels 
of methane, far more than any of the freshwater sites. Now published in M Systems, we need to um, investigate how it is occurring. Obviously, we aren't content with these recent developments as protesters and activists aim soup at Mona Lisa again at Paris Louvre. They threw soup here, as everyone has seen this. These two women not having it and causing a scene. What a spectacle. Looks like a good time. Moving on from most recent climate updates beyond uneffing believable. Yesterday we had a new record high. Global sea surface anomalies reaching 21.12. You can see there from the chart we are in new territory. Never before seen. January was the warmest on record at 1.56 above pre-industrial levels. And it's difficult to explain by natural climate variability alone. We have James Hansen speaking out, saying uh, rising by 0.35 by 2034, whereas mainstream is keep feeding us this BS that we're only moving up 0.20 C per decade. So more like he's saying 0.4 to 0.5 degrees Celsius. So we'll be well over 2 degrees in the 2030s, having a jolly old time in while climate scientists can say the rate is again rising global sea surface temperature is going again literally off the charts global coral heat stress stress shows this it is escalating again here from le monde reporting on the same information and you can't escape it the air is unfit to breathe the oceans are acidifying and boiling don't drink the water they put something in the water finds microplastics in nearly all american proteins meat fish and plants okay it's literally in everything from even vegetarian alternatives found 88 percent of them contain some form of microplastics size of a grain or human hair which carry a host of you know health risks we take in 11,500 microplastics a year Highest protein consumers taking in as many as 3.8 million plastic fragments and fibers, me included, while Kim readies for conflict in Asia. And Americans are not feeling it with each other. American adults redefining their happily ever after, according to Love Lowdown, a study of modern romance from Harlequin. Apparently, U.S. adults are placing less emphasis on finding a long-term partner and prioritizing self-love and friendships as paths to social and personal fulfillment. They surveyed 2,000 adults and found that fewer than half of them who are unmarried or actively dating are in long-term relationships, and 50% of those are dating are perfectly comfortable with their single status. So we've changed our norms from this romantic ideation of what relationships are supposed to be don't lie we all have seen our previous generation experience their own set of woes being together for a long time and maybe we're starting to catch on that throwing all your eggs in a one basket for that long isn't necessarily desirable or at least having unrealistic expectations let's just say that and we're basically backing off but they do say if you want to find love and have that connection uh, summer is the best, then spring, and least time is fall and winter. Yes, and you can just move on and jump on a dating app and find someone else. No big deal. And lastly, what I expected all along is a new study linking anxious attachment and materialistic values. You know the type, people who buy the new iPhone and drive the luxury vehicle. They have to show off what they have. You know, something is deeply missing in them. And studied in the personality individual differences reveals a fascinating tie between anxious attachment styles and their tendency to enjoy indulge in status signaling consumption. The attachment theory, you know, cornerstone in psychology, explains how early life interactions with caregivers share our adult relationships. This theory identifies three primary attachment styles, secure, anxious, and avoidant. Avoidant is marked by dismissive relationship needs and focus on self-reliance. 
Self, secure attachment is characterized by trust and confidence in relationships and contrast sharply with anxious attachment, where individuals crave closeness and reassurance, often leading to relationship challenges. I was just living with several people like that in my life who are deeply anxious attachment styles. And we've identified different behaviors and consumer choices, but to explore this, they studied over 2,000 participants and reported their attachment style, materialistic values, and tendencies towards status consumption. Simple direct measures were to assess these variables, and the findings were striking. Individuals with anxious attachment styles reported significantly higher levels of materialism and a greater inclination towards purchasing status signaling goods. They need, so simply put, this behavior was mediated by their materialistic values. Or simply put, the findings suggest that individuals may use status consumption to cope with insecurities in relationships. Okay, of course, this is self-reported data, but let's be honest, people need to fill that gap, that void of feeling unloved in our culture who were brought up in not so desirable circumstances, perhaps with their parents fighting or not showing them love, experiencing their own difficulties, and that carries on later in life, things to fill the void of feeling unloved which is something we all need. Well, this has been what's happening in the world. Please hit like and subscribe. A quick update for February. We're just getting going. A new day, new month, new you. And your support for this content means a lot. Donations go a long way, even a few dollars. Use the super thanks, or I would prefer the PayPal donation link below as that goes directly to me. I don't collect the super fund payments in chat until much later. But thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. See you, folks.